Yeah, thank you, I am, you know, for recording this. Uh, thank you so much again. Yeah. So we're getting started in about one minute. Uh, Aparna, I hope you are here. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, welcome all. Uh, this is 5 p.m. Uh, India time and uh, 8.30 a.m. Chile time uh, for uh, Aparna Benaji. Uh, you know, it's pretty early for her and uh, we thank her, you know, for her uh, uh, generous time and energy. Uh, she also loves uh, children and she has got an amazing experience on uh, microbiology. She worked extensively on um, uh, dyes and as well as you know, microbial enzymes. She's also a bioinformaticist. She's also the Women in Biology Chair for BioClues. And um, uh, she did a PhD from uh, uh, University of uh, uh, Burdwan in uh, West Bengal. And then uh, she went on to gain uh, a couple of years of postdoctoral experience uh, in uh, Latin America. Uh, and then subsequently, she got uh, uh, assistant professorship over there at University of Catalo Mola in uh, Ch in chile so uh, that's where uh, in santiago uh, she is um, uh, going to give us uh, a briefing on uh, microbiology and how uh, microbiology you know, could be applied uh, uh, or, or 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 bioinformatics applications you know for microbiology and we also have ayam gupta who is helping us with uh, the recording and the live thing thank you so much ayam I am will take uh, tomorrow about systems uh, biology and protein interactions. So these two are the uh, exciting things uh, uh, for uh, you know for you to move forward where you can do a lot of exercises. Uh, these exercises after these exercises we have one final talk on October 9th uh, on introduction to statistics. So once this is done, uh, we will have. Um, uh, a project will we'll split you into different groups and we'll be doing you know some kind of you know, projects okay so thank you so much Aparna, for your time so uh, uh, you know the time is yours please yeah 
Bhavya is with me and all other seven students are online. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Prime. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I let me let me start with the presentation first. One minute, I will just uh, silent my mobile. Please tell me when it's visible. I am not able to understand if it's visible. Is it visible now? The presentation? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Okay, uh, so I will talk on I'm Aparna Banerjee and I'm working as assistant professor in one university in Chile. Uh, it's in South America and Chile is very famous for uh, its Andes mountain and because it's in a earthquake prone zone, so the entire uh, uh, entire uh, west coast of Chile uh, that's looking forward to Pacific Ocean uh, for a lot of volcano have a lot of earthquakes so we for us it's like the earthquakes are very normal and we get up with earthquakes like little earthquakes uh, and it's an interesting country like India uh, in India the north uh, the Himalaya region is almost permafrost some part of the Himalaya so we call it third pole and the south is uh, very hot uh, for, for nearly tropical region. So if we just flip India out from north to south to south to north, it will be Chile. The north is Atacama Desert. And Atacama Desert, we know it's the highest driest point in the world. So it's kind of similar for its environment with Martian environment. A lot of work has been done, microbiological work, uh, bioinformatics work, on the biodiversity of Atacama Desert, what type of microorganisms stay there. And if we see the South Pole, Chile has the nearest point to Antarctica. So a lot of part of Chile in the South is permafrost. And so, both the countries have a lot of similarity in terms of the extreme environment. And I will talk something related to this, how the microorganisms survive there and to relate microbiology with bioinformatics. So I will talk on bioinformatics in microbiology, its identification and applications. There is a photo, one, uh, some spots over that. These are microorganisms but not one cell. These are when a lot of microorganisms, they grow together, they form a colony and they are very domestic animal. They always go together. So one, one spot that we can see in that plate and the plate have some media that microorganisms survive, they all the time grow together. So maybe in one spot, there are millions of microorganisms over there. So basically these microorganisms or the bacteria, they are essential for life. We have some fear for the microorganism as we think like most of the bacteria are like pathogenic. What is bacteria? And we have some fear for them. Actually, there is nothing to fear because most of the bacteria are beneficial and they do not cause any disease. And bacteria lives everywhere, even in otherwise inhospitable environment, the bacteria thrives. For example, in India, we know that in um, Manikaran region, there are a lot of hot springs and the microorganisms live in that hot water of nearly 90 degrees centigrade. The microorganism can live in permafrost like Himalaya, like North Pole, like South Pole in fumarolas, in the volcanic zones, in desert, in soda lake, like lonar lake in Maharashtra, in air, in water, in plants, in animals, in human, even in stratosphere, in the hydrothermal vents of the deep sea, the geysers, 
nuclear contaminated site, acid mine drainage, and even where, where there is a lot of UV exposure. As we know in the south uh, of our planet to the southern hemisphere, um, there is a ozone hole. And in the southern hemisphere, there is a lot of UV exposure. And Chile have this UV exposure in different parts. And even microorganisms survive in this kind of region. So when you think about how we, we talk that human also have microorganisms. So there is a, stati a statistics that an adult human is colonized with hundreds of bacterial species. And the total microbial biomass in an average adult is around 0.2 kilogram. Imagine how much. So a big part of our body is consisting of microorganisms. Think of your weight and then think 0.2 kilogram, but this is in adults. And why we need to talk about microorganisms? Because the microorganisms, they are very much helpful to us. They produce enzymes, they produce antibiotics that we take uh, for our uh, regular uh, diseases or, or some bacterial infection. Uh, they produce some functional carbohydrates. Uh, for example, we call this functional food or some this time they are called as prebiotics uh, that uh, boost our immune system so that we become more powerful. They produce many different type of drugs um, and they, they also produce biofuels and more. So these are the reasons why we need to know microorganisms because they produce a lot of things and they help mankind with their products. So how will we really get to know which microorganism is producing which product? And there comes the identification part of the microorganism. So how can we see the microorganism and identify them if the bacteria are so, so small? We can basically see them through a compound microscope, through a light microscope, as we can see in the left. This optical microscope is with compound lens system and one external light source. And in the right, we are seeing one image that we are seeing in the microscope that have some violet colored uh, bacteria, some pink colored bacteria, and both the violet and pink have some rod shaped bacteria, which are called bacilli, and also some um, cocci shaped bacteria. So uh, the circular bacteria. So this is how we are seeing this color. Basically, this is the method is called gram staining. And this staining is a very basic uh, procedure to distinguish and classify the bacteria into two large groups. One is gram positive bacteria and another is gram negative bacteria. And the name gram staining, this gram comes from one Danish bacteriologist, Hans Christian Gram, who lived till 1938 and who developed this staining technique. But imagine in this B group of gram positive bacteria and gram negative, there are thousands of bacteria and there are different hundreds of staining methods to stain bacteria for different kind of bacteria. So there are, there are so many bacteria, some are culturable, some you cannot culture in the laboratory, some are non-cultivable bacteria that you cannot do culture in a plate. So how you will understand them? How you will do the staining and get to know which bacteria they are? And in this part comes the help of bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is such a subject which cannot go alone and microbiology is such a subject which cannot go alone without holding the hand of bioinformatics. So there is a phylogenetic approach to identify the bacteria and bioinformatics is the torch bearer there. So this process is basically called 16S gene sequencing. We know that the bacteria have its genome and the 16S ribosomal gene, how these genes come? This is the RNA component of the 30th subunit of bacterial ribosome. We know that the bacterial ribosome is 70S Zedberg unit. So basically this is divided into 50S and 30s, two subunits, one large subunit and one small subunit. So the large subunit have 123s so, and one 5s and some ribosomal protein. And the 30s, the smaller subunit, has the 16s ribosomal uh, RNA and some ribosomal protein. This basically, this, this part is the gene that is almost same in different various of bacteria and they are present 
in all type of bacteria. We call it consensus sequence that is present in all different group of bacteria. So we can basically identify them through this that is present in everyone but is unique to them. And this 16S rRNA gene sequencing is one of the most common method. There are other methods too like DNA DNA hybridization but we will not go into that. This is the most common method targeting the housekeeping genes that is common in everyone to study the bacterial phylogeny and classify them according to the genus or species. It basically it assists to differentiate the bacteria between very closely related bacterial species. For example, we can understand one bacillus from the gram staining. Like we saw in the last slide, there was one, here we can see like the in the image, there is uh, some violet colored rod shaped bacteria. So they are bacilli, but they can be geobacillus, they can be lactobacillus, they can be different type of bacillus. And how to differentiate between them? There come this part, this 16S gene sequencing, and they can differentiate between very closely related bacterial species. And they are really very different because these lactobacillus also have different species. We know that when we take card, when we take yogurt, these lactobacillus are the probiotic bacteria that boost our immune system. And geobacillus, in contrast, it is a bacillus, but they stay in very hot environment, like a hot spring, like a hydrothermal vent. They are very closely related, but very diverse. Also, they produce different kind of uh, secondary metabolites or products that is helpful for us, the human. Also, in many clinical laboratory, they rely on this method to identify some unknown pathogenic strain. For example, some bacterial disease occur and we don't know which bacteria it is. We can go for the sequencing and can understand. As we told that some species are so similar in staining method that we cannot identify which particular genus or species they are. But according to the guideline, if the sequence of the genes, for example, A, T, T, G, C, C, G, A, like this one, big sequence of gene, um, they have around less than 90, more than 97% similarity with the 16S gene, then they are different bacterial species. And which is less than 97%, they have to classify it using alternative approach. So they are not, they cannot be done with this approach. But mostly in general, a lot of bacterial identification can be done via this method. So how we can uh get to know about this how we can do this basically we have to isolate the bacteria then we have to take its dna out we have to extract the bacterial dna from the bacteria a very common method to that we can basically do like one experiment little experiment in home so we we have to use some surfactant like some liquid soap and if we can give it some shock in hot water and then in cold water. So it's like you are changing its osmolytic situation and also giving it a shock to hot and cold and there will be the um, cell wall of the bacteria will be ruptured and the DNA will, be DNA will come out. Though it is not something like one uh, perfect uh, methodology, but in this way we can start thinking how to break the bacterial cell and to take its genome out. And then we have to amplify the gene because the gene is very small. One bacteria is so small and then its gene will be very small. So we have to do, we have to amplify the gene. There is a machine called uh, thermal cycler and the process is called polymerase chain reaction. So when we have a particular gene sequence and we from one to two to four, to 16 like that, we amplify and amplify and amplify to several uh, sorry, cycles. This machine help us to get one, D one copy of DNA from one bacteria to several thousand copies of that DNA. For example, now when we have the coronavirus patients and we have the RNA of coronavirus, how we are identifying it? We know there is a process called PCR process, isn't it? So with this PCR process, we amplify one small, very small gene sequence of the same virus or bacteria to a big proportion of uh, quantity. And look, now here we are showing, uh, it's NCBI uh, website, National Center of Biotechnology Information. 
And here, for example, we are taking one bacteria that is called Bacillus lichenniformis. This Bacillus lichenniformis is very well known for its different enzyme production. For example, it's produced one enzyme that is called uh, amylase. And this amylase enzyme is regularly used in starch industry. We know we use starch for, um, for our uh, uh, daily wares uh, because we want to make our daily wares iron and we use starch for our daily wear thing. So it is used a lot in textile industry. And the enzyme helps uh, the hydrolysis of starch, this amylase enzyme. And here we can see in the right, if we go to the option, we will see that if we go to the option of blast, and here we can see how the phylogeny look. So let's uh, go to the... Is the web page uh, observable, everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. okay, so we came to uh, NCDI. I hope you all know about this. It's like one database, National Center for Biotechnology Information. And they have a lot of sequences within them. They have some nucleotide sequences. They have some whole genome. They have the structures. They have some proteins. They have a lot of things deposited in this website. So let's select nucleotide. And for example, let's search Bacillus lichenniformis. You can search any bacteria that you want. You can search here and the bacteria will come. So, for example, let's search this 16 a sequence because we want to see which bacteria it is and their phylogenetic tree from where they came, who is the ancestor of them. So, look, this is what I was seeing. You can download the sequence. You can also blast the sequence. And there is a lot of other sequences of Bacillus lichenniformi. So, whichever you search, type here, it will automatically come. So, if we go to blast this option, So I, ho I, I hope you have earlier heard a lot, a little about BLAST. So what the BLAST do, they basically align your sequence with the other similar sequence that is available in the database. And then they try to identify which ancestor strain have the highest similarity or the most possible similarity with that strain. So here we can RNA and the 16S ribosomal RNA sequence we select. And now let's blast. So it will take a little time and the. So imagine we can just sit in the home and we can search whatever bacteria we know and we can search their gene sequence and can just align them. And look, they have aligned with 100 different related bacteria, a lot of related bacteria, lichenniformis or areas or halotolerance, different other. We can change here. We can do it 10, we can do it 50, 100. Let's, for example, go with 10. So there is a lot of species that we can see other than Bacillus lichenniformis, Bacillus area, subtilis, swazi. And if we go here, this distance T of result, so it will open one tree. And look, here we can also change how it will look and we can change the colors. And this will show us which is the most similar to it. And so we can understand which bacteria we are seeing and how this bacteria is related to the other relevant strain of this bacteria. So we can basically see here the alignment look, how they have aligned our query bacteria with the subjects. And so these are different things that we can, and look, it's also showing which is similar and how it is, and what are this group of bacillus are called farmicutes. And these are the heats of the blast. So which one is most similar? Look, the second one. And then some others. And 
we, we can play with this a lot. We can search any other. For example, let's start try with another bacteria. For example, I was talking about geobacillus. Bacillus lichenifolmis is one bacteria that survive in normal temperature like uh, 37 degrees centigrade to 46 degrees centigrade to 35 degrees centigrade. This geobacillus chirothermophilus, they are also bacilli. If we stain them with gram staining method, you will see them almost similar. But the geobacillus chirothermophilus being both are bacilli and stained in violet color, we cannot distinguish them, And but we can distinguish them through phylogenetic approach. And if we go to blast them, there will be a lot of other geobacillus sequence. You can select any one. And then we can go to blast. Just need to select here the RRNA database so that there will be only 16S RRNA sequence. This takes a little time because they align our bacteria with a lot of other bacteria that is available or this, the, in the database. So look, they are showing almost 100. We can choose 50, we can choose 10, the amount we want. And look, they are showing other than Geobacillus teorothermophilus, many other strains which are very similar to this bacteria, very, very similar. Look the similarity. It's some geobacillus teorothermophilus, one strain, it is showing 100%, but the others are also very similar. As we talked, more than 97%, these are related. So look, it is showing 99, 98, 98, very per, too much percentage similarity. So they are highly related strains. And if we go to the tree, it will show us one tree and with which one it's most similar. So look, it's most similar with the Geobacillus teorothermophilus. It was showing 100% similarity with that particular strain. And we can also download it, download it in PDF file. So we can also see it whenever we want, we can download the file too. We can also see the alignments, how they have aligned with other uh, bacterial sequences. And here there is a summary of the blast. If you have here, uh, look the similarity. It's more than 200. Uh, and if we have here 100 sequences, there will be 100 different because we have selected 10. So here there are only 10. And we can also see the taxonomy. It was showing most similar with your bacillus teorothermophilus. So uh, this is the way we can... Uh, We were talking about, now the presentation is uh, visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, thank you. So now we get to know that when we, we are seeing one bacteria in microscope, how we can get to know with the help of bioinformatics, which bacteria they are. And we can just get to know which bacterial genus it is, which bacterial species it is, all. So now, Let's think about when we identify a bacteria, how we can get to know how they are helping us. And there also is the application of bioinformatics in microbiology to protein analysis. So the common fermented food that have bacteria, we can see here, like we normally take everyday card, yogurt, sour cream, uh, cafe drink, lassi that we take, some fish sauce, and kimchi, miso, in different parts of bacteria, in different parts of the world, there are different kind of um, back fermented foods like cheese that we take, paneer that we take in India, sorkrat. In different countries, the culture of fermented foods are different, but bacteria are regularly used in common fermented food. Now in the fermented food, what are the things? Enzymes. 
this in increased enzyme help in absorbing more nutrient more vitamins more supplements so we need to take fermented foods they are also probiotics they are good bacteria and they help us restoring the balance of the gut digestion and immune health and they give us gaining immunity they support our immune system there is a factor called safety the lactic acid that is created during the fermentation process because they are acid they kills the pathogenic e coli and making us safer to consume than raw vegetables so basically because they they are bacteria and they are killing the other bacteria because they are producing one acid that is not dangerous for us but for the bacteria and you know this e coli maybe we all know e coli this e coli we have the idea that e coli stays in our uh, gut and they help us but there is a little difference between two e coli the same escherichia coli one we call pathogenic and the other are helpful how the same e coli only the thing is sometimes this e coli they produce fimbri what is fimbri so for example one bacteria and they have several appendages small small appendages outside their cell so it's like when they crawl and um, let's search here fimbri so this is a flagella but these are the small small appendages that is called fimbri so what they help a bacteria they help the bacteria to attach to a particular part so for example sometime we have urinary tract infection when we go to public toilet and the most common cause of urinary tract infection is one pathogenic e coli they are nothing but the same that we have in our digestive tract but the thing is they produce fimbri and they just get attached to our urinary tract and then they crawl up 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 more up more up and whenever they are attaching which ever part of the wall of our urinary tract they they become one to two two to four because they divide and they divide and they divide and what happens because they attach to our tract the tract have tract got inflammated because you are scratching one wall simultaneously one after another and continuously continuously so our uh, tract get inflammated sometimes blood secretion occurs and sometimes they crawl directly to our kidney so it's imagine only because of one fimbri one become pathogenic and the other remain non pathogenic this is the way that the fermented food helps us in safety then there is a factor of preservation because it's a fermented food and we can think ah these are bacteria but this lacto fermentation process this they basically store the food longer than the canning because they, they have lactic acid and it's acidic so there is less possibility of any other bacterial infection in that food so the shelf life of the food will be longer than the other type of food and also the fermentation process increases the nutritional value by enriching with different nutrients so one factor that is very important that the bacteria produce enzymes and we know that enzymes are protein in nature so we can we can do a lot of things with bioinformatics we will discuss some today let's basically think how the protein actually looks in its structure maybe you have heard earlier about this but in a very simple way if we think protein has four different structure primary secondary tertiary and quaternary and if we think of one single stream for example here we see one uh, iron ware and here we can see one copper ware so just one straight iron ware this is a primary structure of protein this is how a primary structure looks one after another amino acids attached to one another and they are just straight so insulin hormone is a example of primary structure of amino acid and then just imagine you are playing with one string of one copper rope or one iron rope and you are trying to make a spring this is a spring and this is a secondary structure they can be helix if the spring is more loose they can be some strands 
they can be alpha helix, they can be beta strand, they can be random coils, different structure. And then in the tertiary, for example, you have one string and then you just scrambled up the str uh, that string. Uh, and it's a scrambled up spring and they have there are different other interactions between the tertiary structure. So for example, uh, in our, it's, uh, it's between basically albumin, there is a mistake. So it's, it can be actin, tibulin, albumin protein. Actin or tibulin, we know these are helpful for our cellular microstructure uh, compartment. And then when we mix two different tertiary structure, one with another, they become quaternary. And we know DNA polymerase, hemoglobin, they are different quaternary structure. So this is how in a simple way we can think of protein structure. But through bioinformatics, we can do a lot of things. For example, this is a primary structure of protein, one amino acid with another linked with peptide bonds. So these are different amino acids. And if we use this XPASI, one website, and its prot parent tool, they will give us all the amino acid composition which one is present from maximum to 0% and along with all the other amino acids like selenocysteine, pyrolysine, everything. So, and we can download, how we will do this? We can download any um, protein sequence from our CSB PDB. I hope you have earlier known about this. So let's, let's see in our CSB PDB, any, as we were talking a lot about So this is rcsb.org PDB, it's protein data bank. And we were talking about one enzyme called amylase. Amylase, for example, bacillus lichenniformis. And look, they are showing us bacillus lichenniformis alpha amylase. And we can just go here. We can download the file in faster sequence. We can download the file in PDB format. So different formats are needed for different type of um, sequence analysis. So as we were talking about Espressi plot param tool, Let's go to XPASI plot param. We know XPASI. This is called Expert Protein Analysis System. And it's a bioinformatics resource portal. They have a lot of analysis tools. How you can see different proteins from different bacteria, from human, from animal, from plants, from different organisms. So we can just paste our amino acid sequence here. Just copy and paste the sequences, the amino acids, and we can just go for computing the parameters. And look, they will directly tell us what is the molecular weight, the PI, and then all the amino acid composition. Everything, they will give all the details. So from here, we can have an idea what is the primary structure of the amino acid? Which amino acids are present in what percentage? So as we were talking here, also look in the, in the RCSB, they are giving us all the details, the organism, the expression system, and how they got the protein, and which type of enzyme, superfamily it is, the classification, and how the three-dimensional view of this protein, how they look, everything. So we can just search any other thing. For example, one common enzyme, catalyst, that the bacteria normally produce. Or... We can select here different other things, the organism, 
we can select the bacteria, archaea, and we can select different type of things here to just uh, see different, just see more uh, specific variety of the bacteria or the organism that we are searching. Let's think. Violence. So we can just get one different enzymes. All these back enzymes have different applications in humankind. And for example, we can also search here protease that break down protein, different enzymes with the name of the bacteria that produce or just the enzyme. And then we just select here from the bacterial species, from the bacteria. So we can just download them and can see here after downloading the you can just copy it and paste it in the related box and you will get to know when you go for the computing the parameters. You will see which amino acid is present over there. So this is how we can get to know how the primary structure of the protein looks with the help of this website. So there we can see also the secondary structure of the protein. As we talked that the secondary structure of the protein, it looks like a helix, like a, in a spring, also can look like a sheet. So this is alpha helix, this is beta pleated structure. And the difference between the primary and secondary structure, in the secondary, there are hydrogen bonds. So this is how one straight string become a spring. They become coiled. And with the help of one secondary structure analysis tool called SOPMA, look here, I have also given the link. We can see which part have which secondary tool and how, uh, which type of percentage they have. They have alpha helix, they have beta sheet, and they have random coils. And here in the um, tool, if you paste your uh, sequence and if you just submit it, you can get to see how they look. For example, let's go to Sopna. Sopna, secondary structure prediction. This is how it was looking. Let's paste our protein. And if we submit it, it will take a little time and will come. We can also go with another, for example, one xylanes. And let's see how different they look and how different their type is. So we'll just paste the sequence and submit. So look, it's showing the result. And how this is the blue part, the green part, for, the, for example, the green part. Let's start with the blue part. The blue part is the alpha helixes, the helices. And then there are some beta bridges and some extended strand. And then again, there are some alpha helix. And then look how how we can distinguish which after which one and we can 
get to know how what type of structure are present over there and we can also see the uh, statistics of who are present there for example alpha helix is present the most 28.57 percent and then extended strand then some random coils are present and some beta turns are present so we can get to know with this tool of uh, secondary structure analysis we can understand what type of secondary structure are there in a mac one enzyme or one protein and look here it is different for xylanes and the alpha helix is 36 percent there are some extended strand of 17 percent and we can just do it with different enzyme from our csb we can just search here the enzyme that we like any enzyme from bacteria any name of the bacteria and then searching their enzyme and they're just going to this tool sopma uh, it's also written in the presentation here the link and then we can get their secondary structure analysis results so this is how it looks and then we can also have the idea of their tertiary structure in the tertiary structure as we talked that it's a scrambled uh, secondary structure so it's look some secondary structure and it's like scrambled and they have hydrogen bonds disulfide bonds hydrophobic interactions salt breeds and for example we will talk today here about one particular tertiary structure analysis salt breeds so we can go to this esbri platform and in this ESBRI platform, we just need to put the atomic coordinates. And the atomic coordinates we can get from its PDB file that we downloaded. And if we just send it, we will get to know what is there. So let's get its atomic coordinate. Why it's happening like this? Actually, my computer is a computer given from a uh, university and it's not getting selected with control A and control C. Um, copy. Let's um, just give me a moment of time. I am unable to understand how I can select all without taking so much time. This will take a lot of time. Uh, it will take a lot of time. Uh, no. Mm. No. No. I 
I'm just sorry. I will just get to solve this by calling some of my colleagues how to select it all. Just give me a moment time. Prash, Prash, are you there? I am unable to actually understand. Is is there some way, like other way, to select entire file in some way? Uh, it's Control E, upper no. Control E. Control E. Yes. E for A. A. Yeah. A. Yeah. Control E. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's go to ESBRI. So there is some input form in the ESBRI. And if we just put here, coordinates and all the salt bridges in the structure look they will show us all the things with lysine with glutamic acid arginine with asparagine and also the position the distance of the salt bridges and all the salt bridges present in that particular protein structure. So if we just go to, to for example, this, and we download the file of xylanase, it will show some different uh, protein structure. We can just play among how the different uh, protein structure looks for different enzymes in their tertiary structure, secondary structure. And we can also select with arginine, with specific, and salt bridge of some chain. Sometimes one protein have two or three chains. And that time we can only see of some diff some chains, not all the chains, separately between the chains.
So look, here it's arginine glutamic acid, arginine glutamic acid, arginine asparagine. And in both cases, we can see the differences. So we can, we have to just go to this link, bioinformatics ESBRI tool. And in the input form, we have to paste the atomic coordinates from the PDB file, just copying and pasting from the PDB file, and they will show us the solid bridges. And this is what we have uh, shown here, the tertiary structure analysis tool through ESBRI. And this is how the ESBRI platform look and the link here, and then uh, how the residue look one another. And so here we learned about how we can see primary structure just for uh, one time recapitulating. We can see the primary structure of the protein if we download the structure from RCSB PDB through plot param. We can see what are the amino acids present in the protein and how much is the percentage. And then we can see the secondary structure, the helices, the beta pleated structures, everything. What are the different components of the uh, secondary structure? Uh, through this tool called SOPMA. And then we can, for example, for tertiary structure, there are different tools, but we have taken just one example of salt bridge and we can see it through ESBRI. And we also learn how we can uh, see the which bacteria classification it is through NCBI BLAST and we can see its phylogenic tree. So what we can do today for exercise for you all, you can do blast of a bacteria of your interest, any bacteria to get its phylogeny. You can just search the name of the bacteria with its 16S. Name of the bacteria, 16S. And you will get the sequence. You just blast it and get its phylogeny. You can just choose one bacterial protein of your interest, any bacterial protein that you know. And you can see all its primary, secondary, and tertiary structure respectively from SOPMA, from, uh, from PROTPARAM, from SOPMA, and from ESBRI, and just tabulate the result that you get. And thank you all. So uh, if you have some questions, just ask me, and I will be happy to answer. And this is one very beautiful line that I like. The greater is the difficulty, the more is the glory in surmounting it. So if in, if in, if in life you are seeing, for example, some subjects in your time now, it's difficult. So if you can learn that subject, there will be more happiness in surpassing that hardness in life. So let's start with questions. If you have some questions, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Aparna, for the wonderful talk. So, children, please uh, ask, you know, Aparna, any 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 questions you may have, and please do these exercises, you know, for the next uh, thirty minutes. Hopefully, you know, she'll be there, you know, to help you. Okay. Uh, uh, I think you now you will be a bit overwhelmed with, uh, you know, uh, these exercises uh, today, tomorrow, and October 9th. Uh, but you know, this is for your good sake because you no. Know, uh, you, you know, you have got a very busy academic calendar uh, until December. So we just thought, you know, we'll finish the other two main essentials of bioinformatics as well, like uh, microbiology, statistics, and systems biology. And then we'll take you through the, uh, you know, projects, you know. So then you need not attend these uh, classes, but, you know, we'll talk to you over phone. Your parents, you know, since many of your parents are also scientists, uh, you know, they're also, they'll also be a part of this project making. And then, you know, you all can make a, a poster presentation during our uh, Indian conference on bioinformatics. Okay. So that is what we thought. I think, you know, you should do all these exercises. So please uh, do it. And Aparna, uh, you know, we'll be happy, you know, to answer you any questions. Please. Yeah. So Jia, do you have any questions, uh, Beta? Uh, okay. Yeah. No, sir. Uh, don't have any doubts. Okay. Okay. Good. Rishi. No, sir. All clear. Very good. Wonderful. Uh, Hiranyada. No, sir. Okay. Um. Uh, Ashu. Pihu. Okay. Pihu says no doubt. Okay. 
Bhavya? No questions. Okay, yeah. So I think you should do this exercise during the next 30 minutes. Yeah. I'll be here, Prash. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, Apana, do it. Um, if you can spare another 30 minutes, please. They'll be doing the exercises. So, uh, so please, uh, or if you please do the exercises for the next 30 uh, minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, you may stop recording, please. Thank you so much. Huh? Just let me know, uh, kids, in whichever part you are like having some problem, how to do it so we can solve it. Maybe Aparna, you may want to ask uh, uh, one or two of them to share their screens so that you know you can check you know whether or not they are doing any exercises. Mm. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Any of any one of you, if you can share the screen so I can see how the way you are doing. Uh, I would like to share my screen because, uh, but because uh, we have 2G in Jammu and Kashmir, I won't be able to because the network oh, okay. is really slow. Ah, okay, okay, okay. 